Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Get your free copy of A Guide to Passively Investing in Commercial Real Estate. Inside, you'll learn the basics of passive income and real estate syndication, what kind of returns you can expect, how to find a sponsor, and how to evaluate the risks. Download your copy in the show notes or visit lifebridgecapital.com forward slash invest better to start your investment journey. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Susan Elliott. Thanks for being on the show, Susan. Thanks for having me, Whitney. Susan has a unique background, uh, and she has lots of experience that comes from paddling waters, uh, whitewater rivers all over the world and realizing that even a dream uh, engineering job would not provide her the freedom she wanted. She also found that slaving away as a landlord prevented her from training for ultra marathons, ex- exploring remote rivers, and taking her daughter on multi-day wilderness trips. Man, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, then she found note investing. With her partners, Susan runs Flow State Investing and helps investors add notes to their portfolio to build wealth with a velocity while helping homeowners keep their homes to build generational wealth in communities across America. Susan, welcome to the show. I want to hear just uh, maybe maybe some uh, whitewater uh, story, uh, unique story that you have. Yeah, well, I um, the a quick and nice one is that I met my husband on the Yangtze River in China, and I was teaching for in a high China. school in China. That was a it was a traveling high school that I was teaching for at the time as a coach and a science teacher, and we were paddling the the three parallel rivers in western southwestern China, Yangtze, Mekong, and Salween. So we got to explore quite a bit. But my husband worked over there for the only multi-day rafting company managing it. And so he and I went back many times and we have this beautiful Chinese connection that we've rafted and kayaked rivers all over the country. I've done one first descent over there. He's done many first descents, which means he's the first person to paddle the river and in known record and um, just gotten to see the Chinese culture and from an extraordinary viewpoint of their river systems in towns that you'd never go to in just beautiful places. So yeah, I've gotten to do a lot of wonderful things with, with my life, I think. Yeah, that's so unique. Uh, Some amazing experiences that most never get to imagine. Uh, But uh, well, you know, that has, uh, that's pushed you into a lot of different directions, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, being able to do those things, uh, you know, and having the freedom to do those things has helped you to strive uh, to do other things as well. Maybe as opposed to that engineering job, like, like your bio talks about, well, give us a little background on maybe your real estate background and, or maybe what pushed you into note investing as well. Absolutely. And I love that you touched upon the the freedom. It's like I had a taste of some types of incredible freedoms in that lifestyle. I pursued experience. I pursued relationships. Um, I pursued helping trans, you know, helping usher people in those landscapes as a guide and instructor, which I loved about it. Um, and I had the freedom, but I was ignoring the financial piece of it. I wasn't getting into huge debt, luckily, but I wasn't building a financial stability. I wasn't building a base for myself. And so I immediately knew I had to get a job and I went into, into engineering. And of course I work in river engineering. So I get to repair river systems and do really wonderful things for for the ecosystem, for clean water. Um, But it was something that wasn't fulfilling in a way that I didn't expect. I expected it to sort of be the solution for what what I what I was feeling was a problem. And at the same time, I found real estate. Um, My husband and I invested in a property. We house hacked it. We converted it into a duplex. We immediately rented it out. At the same time, I was going to all kinds of events, learning about different kinds of of real estate investing and and found my now current partners, Jamie and Kevin, and and, um, decided to do a couple of different projects with them. We we did some short-term rental management. We have our own, a couple other properties that we manage as short-term rentals. And and we're just kind of getting getting used to each other, kind of feeling the waters with each other because we both knew that we loved real estate enough to want to build a business in it. And that's a different perspective than just saying, I want to do this on the side. And I think when I got started in real estate as a landlord, I thought, oh, I'll buy a house a year and in 10 years, I'll be able to retire happily. And, um, 
And I, I just loved it a lot more. I loved the potential, the social potential to be able to help people in their homes. And, um, and, and luckily we all sort of went to a notes workshop. We loved the idea that we saw an incredible business model there to be able to take non-performing notes and turn them into performing. And, um, and we sort of hit the ground running. Well, let's get into the note investing in just a second, but I wanted to ask you, you house hacked with your husband. Would you do that again? Oh man, that was my strategy. I thought, oh, we'll just move every one or two years. What's the big deal? And I have an infant, not a big deal. But you know, and it, it wasn't <laughs> until until we found what was our dream home, and and that was like, and our dream home being a manufactured three two, but in the town that we love, that where all of our friends live, where I can walk to the playground with my daughter, and um, and so I think that putting my um, pivoting into notes has has allowed me to say, you know what, I don't have to move every two years to, to do the house hacking, but it wasn't so bad at first. We had a really good, um, a good tenant next door. So, yeah. Okay. Well, there's so many different perspectives on house hacking. I just wondered what yours was. Uh, but yeah, you, you were married. And many people do it before they're married. And, you know, and I would, yes. Okay. That, that seems so great. Right. Uh, but after being married, especially with an infant, that, that can add some challenges to that dynamic for sure. I see, well, I tell see us, it fitting into a, a travel lifestyle really well. So we might house hack and say, oh, but it, we're, we're traveling for three months a year or six months a year. So I think that there's some great family potential in travel hacking. If you also pair it with a, a travel lifestyle, lifestyle, world schooling, homeschooling, that sort of thing. But that's another conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, tell us, you know, what is note investing? You know, let's dive in there just, you know, uh, to get started, but somebody that's brand new to note investing, uh, what is note investing? Uh, you know, are, are you, are you writing notes and is, are, <laughs> what is yeah. that? It's a good question because even, even people who've been in real estate a long time, don't quite haven't, haven't had the the opportunity to wrap their heads around the note. So the note is the packaged deal that is the loan documents and the loan documents, your mortgage, right? We think of it as the mortgage, but the mortgage is just one element of the note. So this is the paper side of real estate, the lending side of real estate. Um, we've almost all been in a relationship with a note, but typically we're on the borrower side of the note. We're, we're rarely on the note holder or the note originator side, but the note package looks like the loan documents, your contract, your terms, your conditions, um, your interest rate, all of those um, that promise to pay. I promise to make these payments for this amount of time. That is secured to the property, to physical property with that mortgage or deed of trust. So the mortgage or deed of trust actually acts as glue that secures the physical property to that loan document as collateral. And what's really nice in the debt world is that um, to have physical collateral is really highly valuable. And, it, and for real estate investors, this is an easy leap to make because you understand the value of that physical property. You understand that if this person does not pay as promised, that you have the ability to take that property and make good on your investment. That's note investing. And what we do specifically is non-performing note investing. And, and that's that's a little bit even harder to wrap your head around because why would you wanna put your money in something that's not performing? Um, but we look for the notes where the homeowners are not paying. They're not paying. We, we do a ton of due diligence to determine why maybe they're not paying, if they have motivation to get back on track with payments. It's owner occupied, they have some equity in there, they've tried and stopped in the past, but they just need a little extra help. So we go in and we work with the borrowers to restructure their payment plan so that then we can help them get back on track with payments and keep their home. And it's a very different strategy than saying, um, I'm going to, you know, go find foreclosed properties so I can fix and flip them. That's not our strategy. We do not want to end up with a property. We want the owner to end up with that property in the end. So who are you buying that proper, the note from uh, the right. bank? Exactly. Exactly. We buy them from institutions. We buy them from banks. We buy them from hedge funds. These notes are bought and sold quite frequently. And I'm sure many people have even seen their, you know, get a letter in the mail that their bank is, their mortgage is no longer owned by Wells Fargo. Now it's owned by Chase and to make payments to Chase. That's when your note was bought and sold. These are, so even in a perfectly good note, these are bought and sold all the time. The banks and institutions are constantly rebalancing their portfolio to be able to make certain loan criteria, right? They've got a lot of, um, a lot of things to consider with that. So they're constantly getting moving paper around, as they say, um, and, and often moving the, this, what they call bad debt or, or debt that's not, not paying, 
um, out. They don't want to take the time to talk to borrowers. They don't even want to take the time to foreclose typically because it takes, it's more expensive for them with regulations for them to foreclose. So they kind of just want to push that out to the secondary market, which is us. So they would rather sell that to someone like yourself and get something for it as opposed to it being a complete loss, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the key there that we're able to buy the, those notes um, at a significantly steep discount um, because they're just trying to, to get something back for it. Um, and even, you know, even not do too bad with it in, in the end, you know, um, because the interest that they're making on this is huge. The banks know what they're doing in terms of making money. They figured it out. They're not, they're not losing a lot of money when they, when they move this around. It's just kind of part of the market. Um, but those of us who have specialized systems set in place to be able to manage these notes can really, um, can really specifically target the exact type of notes we want. And what's nice is that these lists can, can even get passed around a little bit, but every note investor might do things a bit differently. So that's a really good tip for those passive investors that are listening. And then if you're interested in adding notes to your portfolio, talk about their specific business strategy because something might align with you and your goals or your values a little bit more than something else where, you know, we go for first position, non-performing, and we help those borrowers get back on track and keep that home. And then we sell the performing note. We we're like the fix and flip of the note space a little bit, but we want to keep those borrowers in there. Other note investors might go for second position, non-performing, first position performing, or you might find note investing opportunities that's just strictly performing, right? You're not getting those at as steep of a discount, but it's the purest form of mailbox money that you can even think of. So let's let's back up just a little bit because I, I, I want to get into that business strategy just a little bit more for the passive investor, things they need to ask somebody like yourself. Um, you know, but what about just how do we invest in a note? How do we even find somebody like yourself or you know, the passive investor that's listening? How do they, you know, it just seems like for, for many that are listening, this may be brand new. We haven't talked about notes in a while uh, on the show. Um, but how do we find somebody like yourself? And then let's dive into how do we know the reputable, you know, those types of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, um, I think that I hang out in the, in the multifamily space. I hang out at conferences. I hang out online. I'm, I'm trying to help investors. You know, I'm reaching out to, to as many passive investors as I can, because I, I do see that it's a hard space to break into. There's, there's, it's, I think that there's a history of it kind of happening kind of behind the scenes and um, maybe with people who, weren't so reputable in the past. And, uh, and I, and I want to change all of that. So I, I think that if, if you're seeing people pop up into the same spaces where you're finding your deals, where you're finding, where you're meeting um, operators, where you're, you're, you're doing that as it is, then those are the people that want to show up for, for you, for the passive investor who is already in multifamily syndications, who's already a landlord in different spaces, and who's already saying, I need to diversify my portfolio a little bit. And I've heard about notes. I think that might be a good option. So I think the same ways that you would try to find new operators, new deals is the way that you find note investors. But it is very important that you vet that, right? We, you want to see that they have a very specific business strategy, and you want to see that they've implemented that business strategy in the past. The biggest. So why, go ahead. why 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 should they consider adding notes to their portfolio? There are let's say they're already passive and multifamily or self storage or you know some other type of of large commercial real estate. Why add notes? Absolutely, that's a great question um, because I do think that it complements a, a bunch of different. Um, different real estate investing strategies really well. So notes first um, are a great way to diversify into many different markets. So instead of putting your money into a single apartment building with 50 units, 100 units, 300 units, you're putting your money into different markets across the country in different notes. Um, now your $50,000 might only purchase one or two notes, whereas it would you know, go into one multifamily syndication in one building. But if you're investing in a note fund or a note pool, sort of you're, you're you're bringing a larger capital as a JV partner, um, you're going to you're going to diversify that across different markets. So that's one good benefit. Another benefit is that it, it fits a different role in your overall tax strategy. Now, note investing doesn't have as many tax benefits as 
that's investing in hard real estate like multifamily. There's not depreciation because you don't physically own the assets. You don't own that physical asset. You own the paper behind it. Now you might end up owning that asset, right? In the end, if you do have to foreclose, but, um, but interest income is taxed as normal income. So if you think about it in that way, it, it's, it's a good way to grow a savings, grow that to be able to put into a, uh, um, a hard asset. So it's part of that sort of ramp up strategy, right? Um, and it's also might be a better thing for your tax sheltered retirement accounts, because you're not going to be able to take advantage of those tax benefits within that account anyway. So put a high yield, you know, investment such as notes inside your retirement account where you wouldn't be able to take, take advantage of that depreciation schedule anyways. And then I think that another advantage of adding notes to your portfolio is that it's a different side of the same market. So you understand, you already understand real estate. You understand the value of owning a hard asset. Um, but the, the debt side of it is just something a little bit new. So it's not as if you're trying to break into Bitcoin. You're not trying to to pick stocks. You're not doing something totally new and foreign to yourself. It's something that you understand. So we're, we're doing the due diligence on that asset in ways that you're very familiar with already. And, um, and, and so it's a kind of a good step to take in that direction to, to be able to diversify a little bit with your portfolio. If, if an investor is investing with someone like yourself, what do they own? I mean, what do they have, you know, if they're investing through your fund or, uh, you know, how does that mm -hmm. work? And what's a, what's kind of the, I know we talked about the business strategy a little bit, but if they, let's say they're investing in a note fund, what's some of the terms they should expect in a fund like that or, or hold times things, you know, how does that work as far as note investing in a fund? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, hold times are typically a lot shorter with this, this business strategy with, with um, note investing. And I, I'm using that comparatively to multifamily syndications, we typically target to have notes back or capital back in 12 months. Now that could be six months to 18 months, sometimes as long as two years, but it's a little bit quicker of a turnaround cycle um, than, than investing in a multifamily syndication. Again, maybe there's a piece of your portfolio that you want to put in that. That's another good reason to diversify. Um, in a note fund or in a note partnership, you might hear that that quicker capital hold time, you're actually owning the the uh, a collateral file. So these are these are hard files that we, of course, are, are very heavily backed up, right? Um, but it's it's a paper document set that that you own, um, and that's one of the three elements of the due diligence. In fact, we're doing. Um, investigation on the, the property in ways that everybody probably listening to this show is very familiar with the market analysis, um, rent, rent analysis, population, that sort of thing. We're doing an analysis on the, the person, the borrower, as to whether they can perform and that paper trail. We're looking for holes in the in the recordings. We're looking for mysterious liens that, that are on there that would impact our expenses um, or potentially make this just not a good investment in general because there's this just full of holes. So you're the owner of that paper. The power here is that you have the house as your collateral to be able to take that back. So we're always underwriting to the value of the house as it sits right now. So we want that to be our minimum return threshold that if we had to foreclose, if we had to go through the foreclosure process and end up with that house, sell it as is, we still wanna meet our, our minimum targeted um, returns, which are about 10%. What's the likelihood of having to go through a foreclosure? I know you're doing all this background work to try to minimize that, right? But let's say, you know, how often does it happen that we have to go for, through a foreclosure? And what does that look like for the investor if they're you know, investing in a fund that's having to do some foreclosures? That's a great, that's a great question. And from our, our sort of 10 plus years of a historic data with our team, we're finding that about 30% of the notes typically go to foreclosure. And that's over the course, like I said, of 10 or 12 years and each within each, you know, years you have different market cycles and, um, but maybe 30% foreclosure, that's probably a conservative estimate. 30% we can get to reperform, we can work with the borrowers. Um, and then 30% are somewhere in between. Maybe we're offering a deed in lieu of foreclosure to help that borrower not have a foreclosure on their track record, but to speed up our timelines a little bit to get that house or a short sale or, or some, some other kind of exit strategy. Um, so they can expect that. Now, when you invest in a pool, if we have um, a, a large number of notes, you're basically taking advantage of those ratios. Um, 
that we're, we're targeting to hit the home run on the reperformance scenario with all of our, our notes. Um, we try to do our due diligence to determine that that's what's going to happen, but it all comes down with that borrower communication. Um, so so it, it's, it's basically just a ratios game. So if you're only investing in one note, you want to be comfortable with that foreclosure return scenario, just because you have a 30% chance of, of, of getting that. But if you have two or three, you're sort of spreading out the, the potential that you're going to hit a home run. What about as an operator, you know, should operators be considering some type of fund, a note fund, you know, for their investors? I think that's a great idea. I think that as, um, as you're looking at deals and you're considering what, what you're hearing from your investors, what they're interested in, what, what questions they're asking during your investor calls, that it might be, it might be a good option to talk to a note operator, to be able to partner with them and offer a note opportunity to your investor group. And I, I say that too, coming off of this market, you know, it's the post, somewhat post pandemic right now, we're still in the phase of opening back up and, um, and it's been a shakeup with, in terms of the, the mortgage world and who is, you know, there's, there's more people in default right now, in other words. And so you might find that that's where the opportunity lies or that there's just, there's ways to do it. Um, it's a really good model that works at scale. So the more notes you can purchase at one time, the better discount you can get often. And, um, and to, so to be able to work in a fund model, you're taking advantage of that a little bit better and, and it, and it works, works pretty well. So it's definitely a I'll, question I wanted, to ask. Yeah. I wanted to ask about, COVID, obviously, and the pandemic over this last year, how that's affected the note investing space. Uh, you mentioned, you know, more people are in default right now. Is that, you know, is that great for note investing or is that, you know, a time you should be pausing? That's, a, well, for our specific strategy, it's it's kind of great. I would, I, I hesitate to even say that because I don't, I don't like right. the thought of more people struggling and being in default, but but what I'm seeing is that you know, and it, it may not be as quick of a turnaround in terms of assets hitting the market. Um, you know, these borrowers are still trying to work with their their lenders to get back on track. Maybe they're working out forbearance scenarios where those payments are tacked on at the end. So you know, hopefully they just work out a scenario. But the likelihood that that lender is going to want to keep that note on their portfolio is lower because there's this sort of point in the history of it where something was modified and it's not, not, it wasn't behaving very well. So they'd rather pass that along to note investors, right? So, um, but then just, if you just look at the numbers of comparatively to 2019, I think at the end of the end of 2020, there was an extra $9.8 billion of, of mortgage debt that was past 90 days due. And that's wow. just from that, that one year. Now, hopefully some of those people, like I said, will get their jobs back. We'll, we'll get back on the making payments, but um, but because the pandemic was such an external thing that happened to people, I'm I'm really optimistic that there's a lot of people in there who really want to work hard to keep their homes, and those are the exact borrowers that we want to work with because they've fallen on hard times, but they really want to keep their this hard asset, this pivotal point in building wealth for their family and generations to come is that home ownership point in their lives. So they know that, we know that. And I, I think there's going to be a lot more willing borrowers to work with coming up. You know, yeah, just on that train of thought, how, how do you prepare for a downturn like this when note investing? What are a couple of things that you're doing to hedge against? I don't know. Or maybe you, you can share with us uh, the biggest risk uh, as well yeah. in note investing and how you prepare against that. Exactly. I think I think the biggest risk is that you're not doing your due diligence on the um, the paper and the property. So you don't you know, you hear horror stories of someone just looking on Google satellite to be able to assess the value of this property and then coming to find that it was burned down. Right. So you're the collateral behind your note needs to be physical. So we get boots on the ground. We get a realtor there. We get a com comparables analysis. We do, we do all of that to be able to assure that, you know, so a risk there is that the market completely tanks and you end up with a house that you can't sell for the amount that you thought you could. Um, now we're doing really conservative estimates there because we know we have to sell this house as is. Our plan is not to fix and flip it. It's it's not to go in and improve the kitchen to get a higher a higher price for it. But what's nice is that we have all of that at our disposal. So something tanks in the market, we can put a tenant in this space because we've done the rent analysis. We know that it could work. You know, we have the ability to pivot into different exit strategies, um, which is really good. 
with note investing. And I think the second risk is that you don't do, you don't know what to look for in that paper trail. And that's where working with an experienced team is so important because that's the unique part of note investing is that you have to know exactly what to look for. And sometimes these are hidden clues. They're not glaring. You have to follow up with everything you're seeing. So, you know, you understand. And sometimes these documents are 80 pages long. Um, a lot of legalese, you got to have a lot of patience. And luckily, um, you know, there's, there's people on our team who love that kind of stuff. Um, so you could come to find that someone actually has a claim on the property before you in line. And they, if you didn't catch that in the paper trail, then you could lose, you could lose your investment. Hmm. Susan, do you have any predictions for the real estate or, or note market over the next uh, six to 12 months? Oh, gosh, I was just listening to Kathy Fetke's Q2 prediction, which I love. Um, and, and that, you know, that with the housing market continuing to, to be so strong and prices going up for, you know, that's, that's good for us and that our, our hard collateral is, is, is very valuable still um, if we need to go and sell a foreclosed home. But it just seems like that there, I don't know, I, I, I do think that there's going to be a lot of people that need help. And I think that it's hard. It's going to be harder for people to buy new homes. It's going to be harder for people to do that. So they're going to want to try to keep their existing homes a little bit more. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I'm always looking at the glass half full and thinking that there's people out there who need help. And there's, there's definitely assets that are coming down the pipeline that uh, weren't there before for note investing. Well, one thing I, I like about what I hear about note investing is that you know it could be an opportunity, obviously, when there's a pandemic or there's issues, right? That you know where note investors can invest. But what you're doing is you're helping this family not to be foreclosed on. Really, uh, you're helping them to stay in their home uh, as opposed to getting foreclosed on. So that, that's just a, it's a neat dynamic of the note investing space that I, that I really like. Uh, yes, your investors can make a return, but while you're also, you're helping, you're providing an avenue for this family to, to stay in their home. So uh, that's, that's incredible. Uh, tell me uh, any, do you have any daily habits that you are disciplined about that have helped you achieve success? Mm, um, waking up very early. Uh, I, uh, I have a three-year-old daughter and um, I do some engineering work as well. And so um, to be able to be really intentional with my priorities. And that involves waking up early, um, doing a meditation with my husband. So, it, you know, we're spending a little bit of, of time together without a toddler around also wanting our attention. And, um, and then just being intentional about those precious morning hours has have been really helpful for me to start my day, um, start my day right. And, and know exactly that I'm spending time you know, with my top three or four priorities in this world. And, and I'm getting better at evaluating if something is not necessarily filling one of those buckets, then it's maybe not something that I um, have time for at the moment. And, and that's really helpful. Just knowing what those top, top priority buckets are for you is really important. Yeah, just so the listener knows, Susan is up at 5 a.m. recording this interview, so uh, she's making it happen, uh, to say the least. So, uh, Susan, what's your best source for meeting new investors right now? I am um, going for runs. <laughs> like, it's amazing that in my community, I've been I've been getting into longer trail runs lately, and um, I just keep meeting new people, and I love finding that they're they're into real estate or they've always wanted to get into real estate. And then they tell a friend and those friends are calling me. And it's, it's a, I love to align with people who also, you know, love to be in the outdoors, love to know, have that as a value in their life, you know, being in natural spaces and, and the sort of mental health and well-being that that provides, is there something there that we can, we can align with. So I guess that's a pandemic response for you is that my only um, socialization is my running groups, but they, they constantly change. So I'm meeting new investors there, but, um, but I'm really enjoying that. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people find us on YouTube, which is interesting. Would you say that the, you know, finding investors in that group that a large part of that is because you all have something very unique, like outside of business or real estate. It's like you're connecting on this other thing, you know, whether it's running outdoors, those things, you know, and that helps to kind of transition the conversation, even relationship into something else like investing. 
I do. I absolutely do. You kind of have this, this shared value of, um, you know, physical fitness one, we're often running for hours at a time in, in, in the mountains around here. Um, I live outside of Portland, Oregon in the Columbia river gorge. And, um, and you also have this perspective, you know, going back to my, my decade spent as a traveling whitewater guide of this, this form of freedom and simplicity in the outdoors where you kind of get that piece of like, what would it be like to, not have, um, you know, big stresses in your life and finances can often be one of those stresses. So when we speak of having financial freedom or time freedom, all of these things, we can, ex we can feel what that's like uh, in these little snippets on our runs. And it almost makes it more of a motivation than to go after it in other realms of our life, like in finances or in our professions and in, in our investing. And so I, I think that those people are just, they kind of get, get why you would be in this long-term goal setting mindset of investing and long-term sometimes as in five to 10 years. I mean, sometimes people can't even think in that, in that long of term, um, but they know that they're in for it. I mean, if this person is in it for a 20 mile run, then they're, they get the long-term, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Oh, coaches. I love being around coaches. I love being around mastermind groups. It's so fulfilling for me to, to hear the parallel path of my colleagues and, and to help them in ways that I can. And um, I've been in a coaching program with, with the ladies at Good Egg lately, and it's just wonderful to, to hear from them and you know their mothers as well. And we all val have similar values. It's just... Uh, it's been really fulfilling. So that, and um, I'm having my own partners, you know, being, I feel so fortunate to have found my partners when I did and be in such alignment with our values alone, mm -hmm. just that's huge, as well as, um, as well as what we want to do with our business. How do you like to give back? You know, I have uh, on my on my um, board right now, I have that I want to keep a hundred homeowners in their homes in the next in the next five years, personally, you know, and maybe maybe in our business a little bit more, but um, but I I love that aspect of note investing that we're we're helping people at that pivotal point. So I see that as as integral to starting a business is that the business is giving back. Um, and then personally, I serve on the board of national nonprofits for river conservation to be able to promote free flowing rivers. Um, I've done a lot of advocacy work in, in my background of wild and scenic rivers. I wrote a guidebook to the 50 most beautiful rivers to paddle in the United States. And, and so being able to speak up for something that doesn't have a voice is really important to me and, and to keep those wild spaces wild and to keep them as resources for us. Again, the mental health aspect of being in the outdoors is huge to me. Yes, it is huge to me as well. I love being outside. I love being out there as a family as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so many things to learn and uh, just breathe some fresh air, right? goes a long way. Uh, Susan, grateful to have met you and had you on the show, especially as early as it is for you. Thank you for your uh, dedication to making it happen. But just explaining notes to us today, whether we're a passive investor, maybe why they, we should have them in our portfolio or even as an operator, why maybe we should be considering some note investing or making that available to our investors as well. Uh, the pandemic and Amongst other pointers that you've you've added that uh, we should be considering around note investing or even uh, vetting an operator like yourself, uh, thinking through their business business plan and you know what happens when a foreclosure uh, comes our way or, or it's a must. So, uh, Susan, thank you again. Tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Yeah, please feel free to shoot me an email. I'm Susan at flowstateinvesting.com or head on over to our website um, and grab our our field guide to note investing to get you started. Um, I'm also on all the social platforms. You can find me on Instagram at she seeks flow and as well as flow state investing on, on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. So I'm on all those channels and I love connecting with people and helping them start to wrap their head around notes. It's just another great option for your portfolio. Thank you for listening to the real estate syndication show brought to you by LifeBridge capital. LifeBridge capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.